I'm sending Daniel and Natalie across Australia to Melbourne on the East Coast where they'll split up. Dan's going bush while Natalie is staying in the city. We also sent some more stealth cameras down to Sid Slee's place. We now have 10 cameras on his property. If the thylacine's out there, we'll do everything to find it. But there's a man who claims to have already captured a modern thylacine on tape. Nat will take that footage to a rare animal expert. Bob Paddle is the president of AFRA, the Australian Rare Fauna Research Association, and he's an expert in animal behaviour. OK, this is some footage from um, an eyewitness who believes this is a thylacine. Well, have a look at it and tell us what you think. Sure thing. It's an interesting sequence in terms of the fact that it's possible to interpret the animal as being striped. It appears to be pushing off its back legs. Uh, it either has an exceptionally large head or it's possibly carrying something in, in its mouth. Remember those scats we found on Sidsley's farm? Well, this is what Bob Paddle has to say about them. Obviously comes from a large carnivore. Uh, lots of fur, lots of bone material there. Fox, dingo, thylacine, you know, it's um, right size, right texture. And though modern science claims that the thylacine died out on the mainland 3,000 years ago, Dr Paddle's research shows otherwise. We have records of scientists actually viewing skins of specimens caught in South Australia and in New South Wales in the 1830s, 1840s. One of the interesting stories from South Australia is they would come into the fire camp and, and take children from round the fire. A fascinating account because exactly the same thing is recorded in Tasmanian Aboriginal records. So the thylacine was bold and fearless back then. Today, it's just as bold, coming into the suburbs. I showed Dr Paddle this story about Nick Costello, who thought he saw a thylacine in suburbia. When I heard it, I came out and I sounded like it was coming from over there somewhere. I could hear it more than I could see it at that point. Finally, after about five minutes, it came out onto the road and that's when I, I noticed it looked unusual. The walk, the gait, it just reminded me of that film from Tasmania, of the Tasmanian tiger. They had the same look about it and it appeared to have stripes at that point. But as soon as it had gone up there further, no sign of stripes again. How could that be? Dr Paddle thinks it was an optical illusion, part of the animal's camouflage. If you examine closely the film of the last specimen, for that short half second or so where the animal is turning around, the stripes completely disappear in the body and it looks like an unstriped animal. Do you think it's at all possible that the thylacine can still exist out there? Formerly the animal is extinct, but there's always a possibility, a very faint possibility, that I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. What do you say to the people that have had so many sightings of these animals and no one's willing to take them seriously? You have to be impressed at the sheer numbers of sightings that are recorded of these animals and recognise that, you know, there have been 4,000 sightings. Even if 3,999 of them are wrong, there's always a chance that one of them might be right. What role have scientists played in the demise of the thylacine, do you think? The knowledge was there to save the species, but it was not done. Yeah, hi, Dan. Yeah, I've just spoken with Bob. Oh, he was fantastic. Yeah, it won't be long. While Natalie is driving to meet Daniel, he rendezvous with thylacine hunter Murray McAllister. But things aren't going well for the boys in the bush. 